Welcome to San Diego Comic Con at Home. My name is Justin Mallon and I am the Chief Creative Officer of DeviantArt. I'm really excited to present you guys with a panel called 20 Years of DeviantArt. Now, as you may or may not know, in August of 2020, DeviantArt turns 20 years old, which in internet years is like 190,000 years. So we're going to talk to some of the people who were involved at the very beginning of DA way back in August of 2020 and even before and gets the inside scoop on what it's like to start a network that's had the kind of global impact DeviantArt has had. We're gonna talk about where that impact went into the world thereafter and talk a little bit about what's coming up for the future. So let me uh, introduce my wonderful panelists today. Uh, I'd like to start with Angelo Sotira. Would you introduce yourself, Angelo? Hi, Justin, I'm Angelo Sotira, CEO and co-founder of DeviantArt. Excellent, Andrew. Hi, Justin. Uh, Andrew McCann, a also a co-founder of DeviantArt with uh, Angela there, way back when. Way back when. And Danny? Way back. Way back. <laughs> Hi, I'm uh, Danielle McKay, or Danny. Uh, I am the Director of Community Relations at DeviantArt. Also known as Moonbeam 13. Moonbeam 13. Minus 13, now just Moonbeam. What's it like to have been known for most of your life by an alias you chose in your teens? Because it's weird for me. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's interesting to me. Uh, it's, it's most fun because uh, for the entire time that I've been working with Angelo, he has never called me by my real name unless it's like a, a really, really important like series. Like Danny, we got to talk. Yeah, exactly. Otherwise, it's always, hey, Beam, Beam, what's up, Beam? So, you know, now I just, it, it is my name. There are no other names. Andrew, you made the very sensible decision of using your last name as your handle. Uh, that was because when I created an account for DeviantArt, I was tired of my uh, my handle. and uh, Article X. Yeah, yeah. So um, I decided to go with the last name. Like, how, you know, radical would that be? But, uh, well, it does age well. I'll give you that. <laughs> so as I was yeah, saying, A lot better than spied. For like crying out people, loud. So no one, no you know, you're there. almost 40 years old and people are calling you spied. You know, it's tough. But... I forgot to mention that. That's spy, not spy ed. I was going to say, what about spy ed? Because they don't call you spy. spy they call you spy ed. S-P-I-E-D <laughs> at hotmail.com was taken. So it, I went with a misspelling because I don't care. DeviantArt is, as we were discussing, one of the old, oldest social media networks in the world. In fact, when it was started, it wasn't even considered a social media network. It was just a community for artists. We predated social media networks. So I want to dive into like the little secret shadowy world of the beginnings. Like how did this start? How did this come to be? Angela, what were you doing before you had this idea? Well, we were, you know, the MP3 uh, movement, we like to call it, was underway. You know, this was a time period where people were like, I don't want to pay $20 for CDs when I only like one track on the CD. Why can't I just buy a track? And MP3s was making that kind of possible, but the record industry wasn't really like complying with it. So there was a really cool MP3 player known as Sonic that Andrew had created. There was another really cool one called Winamp um, that uh, AOL bought. Um, and, uh, and we created a I, you know, community for skin, uh, Winamp skin uh, artists. And we wanted to create a community for Winamp skins and Sonic skins and wallpapers and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, artists on those two sites were starting to post paintings onto Winamp skin and, you know, Winamp facelift. And it was just kind of a weird thing to have happen there. So we were like, all right, cool. Let's create a platform that, you know, allows any submissions whatsoever of any kind of creativity. What would we call that? Well, we wanted to make sure that, you know, uh, it was about deviating your desktop or changing the look of your desktop. Uh, and changing the look of your applications and something that sounded wicked or cool or whatever. And Matteo came up with, uh, with deviant art and we could call them deviations and we can call the members deviants. Wouldn't that be fun? But definitely worked back in 2000, 2001. I don't even remember thinking it was odd. I was like, yes. Yeah, no, it totally wasn't. It wasn't right. unless you, you started surfing for maybe things your parents didn't want you to think you were surfing for and realizing that, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Andrew, you, you were uh, the founder of Sonique, yes? Yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, one of, one of, yeah. Right. I, I remember profoundly the impact that Sonique had on me in terms of the visual, visualizations and creativity that it brought to the desktop environment. 
Whereas Winamp, you could skin the box that Winamp existed in. Sonic was really a multifaceted, multi-level thing that could be customized. You, you know, people really got into to music, had, you know, crazy hair or whatever, some kind of lifestyle. And then you brought music to the desktop, which was really neat at a, you know, like Angela was saying earlier, you know, you could finally, you know, get a song or, or whatever, not a CD, but you had to play it you know, uh, back then it was pretty much windows and, you know, square windows with little, you know, X's in the corners, just, just kind of took the soul out of music. <laughs> right. Um, and so Sonny and Winamp and, you know, I think that whole uh, world was trying to bring some of the heart of music into the interface and whatnot. And I, you know, that's what we were trying to do. And, you know, uh, Sonny was known, uh, is one of the first, applications that wasn't a square you know and that's really what i was trying to do with that initial one it's like and the the first ui even embraced that it was uh it was almost geometrically like two circles right it was just it was really trying to say in your face not square well, so yeah, that's sure. <laughs> i think it is interesting to note and remember how intertwined uh music was with the beginnings of real creativity on the internet in terms of the tech solving and design solving and then the birth of something like DDNR to allow even more creativity to infuse what was essentially a music driven boom of technology, right? Yeah, uh, I just, I don't know, I, I, I like what I said earlier, like I like that idea that, that um, we were trying to take some of the creativity and, and whatnot and, and allow it to exist on this platform that otherwise was just sterile. And, and, um, and that's what, you know, uh, later on Angelo approached me uh, um, with Stephen Art and, you know, uh, or Ian and I actually, and, and, uh, said, you know, we're making, he's, we're making this, you know, we'd like to host Sonny Skins there. And of course, you know, we'd support that. And, um, and then I was just interested in it at another level. Cause like, I like art too. And, and, um, it just spoke to me in terms of, you know, sort of an extension of not just music, but like, you know, taking it, to other realms outside of music. Let's back it up there. Because of this, because of this context, you know, and Andrew and Ian were, you know, uh, quite a few years older than me. I mean, I think like I must have been 18, you know, I met them when I was 16 and, you know, I must have been 19 when we started DeviantArt. So they must have been 23, 24 at that time. And so I really looked up to these guys. Um, they were doing the stuff that I thought was the coolest stuff, you know, and, and, this, and a lot of people thought was the coolest stuff happening. Um, and it was an era that I think was being defined by deviation. Like it was really all about, you know, this kind of stuff. I think we really nailed it on the, on the term for that era. But, um, you know, I begged Andrew, I think, for about five years to join the company as our CTO. Uh, he did join as, our, as an investor and, and a participant in, in the very early days without whom we wouldn't have been able to do it. And his advice and some of the contributions that he made in code were critical uh, to us even being able to function on, on the Internet. Well, let's talk about that a little bit. So I think we've covered the circumstances of what led to DeviantArt well, and the meta of the internet and created the birth to DeviantArt. But what was the intent in creating it? What did you think you were making and how did that differ from what you actually realized that you'd made pretty soon on? So here's what was happening. So um, I, we did Winamp facelift and then, uh, and then the, I paid the, the guy, Mark Screech, I paid him to build Winamp Facelift for me in exchange for a little bit of money and some hosting space on the DMusic servers. And what he did was he turned around and he created customize.org on that same server resource, which basically rendered Winamp Facelift useless. I mean, just a totally gangster move. Like he totally like, you know, built a platform, which then I was getting traffic reports watching customize.org completely overtake DMusic, completely overtake uh, Winamp Facelift and so on and so forth. So I was like, you son of a, you know, oh man. So then when we came up with an idea uh, for DeviantArt, it was clear that the, the reason Customize was more successful was because it offered support for all skins. So our solution in response to Mark, in a very competitive way, by the way, was uh, what if we offered a platform where you could submit absolutely anything, poetry, uh, literature, uh, wallpapers, skins, artwork, paintings, digital, traditional, everything, just anything anybody wanted, tattoos, just right away, we would support it. 
Um, and that was the real answer to the question. And it was also the ultimate payback to Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Um, revenge. <laughs> it was all about revenge. It was competition, right? We were all very clever little, you know, clever people doing clever things all the time. And, and it was a very, very awesome uh, group of folks that were very early on on the internet, um, uh, capable of, you know, building really cool websites, uh, writing really cool programs and apps. Um, you know, uh, Stardoc and Brad Wardell and all those guys were building window blinds and you know, the, the, there was just a really cool kind of renaissance going on in terms of what you could do with your computer. And, and, um, and so we, you know, I think we came up with the right answer for that moment. Um, but it, but it was not totally, it was intuition. And then we had the right formula at the end, but it could have been just as easy that somebody else would have done the right thing in that moment. It was, it was a little, you know, that's where they, a little bit of luck comes into play, you know, being at the right place at the right time. And, and I think a little bit of that was going on. Well, speaking of creative people sort of leading in that space, DeviantArt was actually an innovator when it came to a lot of different tech and a lot of different stuff that we see on the internet now. And I think that one of the, the paramount examples that comes to my mind for that is the, the, the placement of dynamic thumbnails that were created for individual deviations and rotated on the homepage. I mean, can you guys talk a little bit about some of the innovations DeviantArt brought to the internet and tech? I mean, this is so good. <laughs> I mean, we're literally um, talking about a thumbnailing engine, right? Yeah, um, uh, that was actually one of the first yeah, things that I that I said to Angelo. I was like, because uh, the earliest versions of Even Art, it was there was the, the submissions, <clears throat> and I remember saying to him, "Well, it's it, you're calling it an art site, but there's no pictures. You know, like there's no, you know, I want to see it. You know, it was just the text links, and you had to you had to click through to the deviation page in order to to see it at all." But I, I also kind of understood it, you know, I wasn't being a bit rhetorical when I was saying that because I also knew that at that time uh, to, to scale a thing down and have it look right uh, was tricky. And, it, and then oddly enough, at the time, we, uh, I remember we also wanted shadows. So like the, 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 a, little, little, yeah, a, drop shadow side, yeah. a little drop shadow a, a, around the image. And at the time, browsers didn't support transparency. So, um, uh, so making it, uh, so anyway, so the way to do that was to actually render the, the drop shadow in the thumbnail itself, or at least that was the, the first go. And so I tried that and then that didn't work so well. So, uh, so I ended up making just an image that went behind it that blended a shadow into the background color. And, and so I made this little, uh, basically a web server that rendered drop shadows at any resolution, at any, uh, X, any width by height. Um, so that was one of the first kind of code contributions that I did for DeviantArt. And um, that we used that for uh, quite a long time until until all browsers supported uh, transparency and CSS and, you know, no longer need that anymore. But at the I mean, time, Anders that was being, a Anders big being deal. Polite, like we, we wanted drop shadows. We, we didn't want drop shadows. We wanted anything that could be a small thumbnail representation. I mean, as far as we were just like anything, you know, and, and Andrew was like, no, 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 but it has to have a drop shadow. I mean, it wouldn't look right if it didn't have a drop shadow. <laughs> yeah, I was okay, like, that's probably right. I was like, wow, <laughs> drop shadow also? <laughs> I, I wanted to ask, when did you guys feel that DeviantArt was more than just another project, more than just another website, that you kind of had a bit of a monster on your hands with it? What, what was your moment of realization? Um, I committed to DeviantArt um, as my thing uh, in roughly 2001 because we started to see it go downhill right I mean uh, you know roll down the hill so to speak we pushed we were pushing and pushing and pushing and then it started to pull us we, we had we had no control over its gravity starting by late 2001 just because it was growing so fast and it needed it was so hungry it was like a baby that was just starving it wanted like every bit of our money every bit of our talent, uh, everything. And, and, and I think it was just so exciting that it was hard to say anything other than like, this is what I want to be doing with my time and my life. And um, I did take the moment to say, hey, look, you know, I see the internet evolving and, and, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, would I be happy over the course of 20 years of my life, you know, later, 
if I had dedicated my time to building the art part of that internet thing that I was looking at so closely and instead of music, because we were doing music before, instead of something else. And um, after some real soul searching, um, I put my college applications away and I was like, look, this, uh, this really pulls me. I really want to do this. Before we get to DeviantArt in the world, I, I just want everyone watching to understand the real magnitude of what DeviantArt that was in that early internet culture. And nothing sums it up better to me than an interaction you had, Angelo, with one of the guys at the Internet Archive. And that blew my mind when you told me that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so in 2004, we went to Foo Camp, which is an O'Reilly event. And when we were there, we, we met Brewster Kale. And Brewster was the founder of the Internet Archive, and he's done a bunch of other cool stuff. Um, and he was telling us, oh, my God, nice to meet you guys. We know you very well. Uh, we, you, you represent some very material percentage of all of the web pages that we index on the Internet. And when we started looking into it, he was suggesting that it was anywhere between 10 and 15 percent of all web pages on the Internet. I mean, I think the reason for this at that early stage of the Internet. I need people to understand what you just said, and that is that DeviantArt in 2004 was 10 to 15 percent of the internet. I could just be remembering that funny. It could have been 5%, but it was some stupid number. It was some insane number. Any percent. Behind a decimal point is crazy. So we sort of covered the beginnings of DeviantArt and the momentum that it started to gain. And Danny, I feel like this is sort of around where you started to enter into the picture, where DeviantArt was becoming a very essential part of the internet experience and the online world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I joined DeviantArt actually as a amateur photographer and only because a friend of mine is an incredible digital artist and was saying, if you, you need to post this and you need to do it here. I had never heard of it, but that was literally how people found DeviantArt back then was through a friend um, who was already on it. It was like the biggest website no one knew about, <laughs> it, it, like the greatest underground club. So I found it and I was like instantly in love with it. There's just a familial feel when you get in there. You just, it's very welcoming. A uh, community almost instantly forms around you, especially back in those days. You know, now it's, it's a little bit bigger. It takes a little more work. But back then, you know, you were almost immediately met with somebody commenting on your artwork or welcoming you or getting a message directly from Angelo. And it was just kind of mind blowing. Um, so, you know, like it, it was, uh, it was a really cool experience and it was very easy to get addicted. Um, and that, that communal feel has never really changed, uh, from what I've seen over the years, from the way that I've, I've heard it experienced by other people, whether they're older or newer members, um, that sense of community isn't something that you get from any other website. You just don't. Um, and I, I'm very proud about that. I, I'm glad that we've stayed true to those roots. Yeah, the internet has certainly evolved since those days. When I think at, at, in the very beginning, the internet was kind of a club in and of itself and being yeah. on it and active on it was like a, not necessarily a core part of one's identity, but certainly something that said something about you. Whereas I'm like now where everyone is just on the internet anytime they're awake, basically. Right. Yes, exactly. So you started off as an amateur f f photographer, but you quickly got involved in the community volunteers program. Yes, I did. Um, there, was, there was a spot. Uh, back then, community volunteers basically just selected daily deviations, uh, which sounded like a really cool thing to be able to do to highlight artwork that you love um, and represent the community that you were so fond of. And I just wanted to be part of that. So I did. And I did that for about a year. And then a spot opened up to actually join staff to take over that department. And I moved into that. Back then, there was no such thing as online community management. Um, you know, it was literally learning by the seat of my pants of a poli sci major. <laughs> I mean, I, some would argue that gives me a little bit of uh, ammunition for doing a job like this. And I would say that that is true. Let's use that poli sci uh, major of yours and tell me like, <laughs> from your experience online and at Deviant Meets, and Angelo and Andrew, I know you have some thoughts about this too. When you, when you meet a Deviant, what is a Deviant? Like what, what, what are their characteristics? How do they manifest? What do they have in common? Oh my God, they're always passionate, always. Um, they, the very first thing someone wants to tell me when they see me is how much they love the site, how much they love the community, what their favorite thing is. They don't wanna ask me anything. They wanna just like give all of this love over and over and over again until you just can't take any more of it. But it's like, it's an 
awesome, overwhelming feeling to have that bounce off of you. Um, it makes you feel like a rock star. It's a little bit crazy. I, I would say I, I agree, passionate. Um, I would also say that there's an inherent, um, and I hate to generalize, but you know, going on a world tour uh, with Heidi in 2009 and all the dev meets that we've done, and you know, I think especially meeting you know 3,000 deviants back to back in 11 countries over 40 days, you know, was a particularly special experience that I um, that I always look back on fondly. And and I and I, I think what I pulled from that is a bit of a generalization, and and it's this sort of sweetness that is, um, you know, consistent, um, this sort of like, um, uh, at the same time, there's this sort of like open mindedness, like somebody comes up to you, they're very like interested, and they're very excited to be there. And immediately within an hour of being at a deviant meet, there's a closeness, which is, you know, I'm looking for my people, the ones that I like that define deviant art for me, I'm looking for those kinds of folks here. And then you see people going off into little pockets, uh, I always have hanging out with each other. Yeah, Every it reminds time. me, sorry, it reminds me of um, university or co like uh, when you're in school in the cafeteria, like that's what happens. So you'll have like this whole giant group and everyone seems to be great. And then all of a sudden, like the lit kids will go off, the digital art kids will go off and they'll just all sit there and you'll have like the, like one group of uh, people just like sketching and other people are just like having a conversation about a plot twist. <laughs> like it just, it, they, they all kind of have their little, they, their little grooves, they find their people and they, they mesh. It's and the, great. The chemistry is unbelievable uh, once you get to that phase and then there's just no desire to go home. Like everybody just wants to stay <laughs> for like the whole, you know, we, we ultimately have to be like, okay, we're gonna shut down the venue or mm -hmm. we have to go, you know, uh, it's been 11 hours or whatever it yep. is. And, and there's just <laughs> a, a desire to keep, uh, to keep it going. Um, it's the party that doesn't wanna, wanna end. And I, I think it's just because, you know, I, I look back on, you know, being a kid in high school, and I remember Mike Correo, uh, Mike Correo was the artist in the back of the class that every, at the end of every uh, class, people would walk by his desk, and he was so fixated on what he was drawing, he didn't even want to stand up to go to his next class, so you could always walk by him because he was always finishing his drawings, you're like, Mike, that's amazing, you know, this is so good, um, and it's like every M Mike Correo from the back of every classroom finding each other finally and having something uh, in common with a larger number of people in one space. The magnetism of that affinity is enormous. And it's what makes a site like DeviantArt so successful. And so what makes a Deviant meet such a singular experience is watching that affinity manifest and these people realize that it's there and they can share it and be open about it with each other in person. Instead of being the guy in the back of the classroom who's not finding that connection anywhere else in the class. You know, I think that's a really powerful thing. Uh, I think it's part of the reason why we have such a passionate community. Um, in dealing with that community, have you guys found any like individual behavior or patterns that you've like found remarkable or entertaining or troublesome? What I find very, very cool about our community, it's kind of, um, I don't even know the word I'm gonna look for, but there's a familiarity with the staff. Like they feel very, very, very much like they can counselors. access us at any time. Like, like they're, yeah. Like, like they, guidance counselors, yeah. Exactly, like we're, we're not like um, the Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook where they can't actually talk to him or say anything. They can talk about him, but they're not reaching him. Right. us they can reach us and they'll talk to us and that's no problem whether it's in real life or on the site like they don't feel any way about sending us a note about what they're thinking at that particular time and there's there's obviously pros and cons to that i mean there is no internet anonym, anonymity for any of us uh i personally cannot go on any social network and not hear about deviantart from someone at whatever o'clock in the morning it doesn't matter they don't care um <laughs> they, they feel they feel like it's their right. And, you know, we've cultivated that and I'm, I'm actually okay with it. Uh, but I can see how other people maybe wouldn't be, but you know, I, I think for the most part, it's a pretty, it's a pretty cool dynamic. Tell me about a time you've encountered DeviantArt in the wild, like when you weren't expecting to, not on another social media network, but just walked into a situation, a room, whatever. It's sort of well, Justin, you know, I, I think this is a good time to turn it around on you a little bit. I mean, you know, your your um, your story at DeviantArt and your story as a digital artist is, you know, very, very, very interesting to the DeviantArt story, right? I mean, and 
2002 or so, you started the Depth Core Art Collective. Is that the right date? Yeah. So 2002, Depth Core Art Collective, you were using DeviantArt's digital art results page to watch for up and coming talent. And as you liked somebody's work, you'd recruit them into your platform of Depth Core. And then every month you would run a competition um, or every quarter, but really in the beginning every month, I thought, was that about right? Good, What's no, the good, story good. there? Tell us about tell us about the depth cores and and what that experience was like because it leads into the answer to your question. Okay, so uh, depth core was a collective I started, um, and I'd certainly farmed DeviantArt for promising digital art talent. Uh, we were very focused on three D and abstract work in the beginning, sort of opened up uh, to be more of an aesthetic focus than a medium focus as time went on. But yeah, you're quite right. In the beginning, we were putting out um, chapters. We called them packs then. Uh, every month, maybe every two months. Uh, there weren't competitions though, and so far as that you couldn't uh, compete to be in there, it was a closed community. It was like a little uh, internet clubhouse. And uh, we grew, I mean, by the time it sort of wound down in 2012, 2013, we, we had a few, a few hundred members that we'd accumulated over the course of a decade. Um, and we'd built a very private place to sort of get to know each other and explore that affinity that I was mentioning before. Um, and it was an affinity that was like really specified into the kind of art that we were making and where we wanted to go with it. And also the fact that it was um, quite adjacent to professional art. There was, a there was a pretty direct roadmap from what we were making in commercial artwork and um, the advertising world. And a lot of us started to explore that at the same time. So Deathcore was a pretty singular thing. It was born like at a moment, I, I don't know it could be done now, but it was, it was really of its time and it was, uh, you know, it, 10, 11 years, that's not DeviantArt's 20 or 190,000 internet years, but it's a solid 50,000 internet years. It's hard to start a website that runs for 11 years that made no money for anyone at any point along the way, you know? I'm not sure how so that wait, but just, just to clear it up, I mean, it was not a competition to be in the pack, but it was a competition to get into the group at all. Sure. Okay, okay. yeah, that's true. There's and, a lot of- And here's the question. Did, did, uh, would you say DeviantArt accelerated the relationship development to produce the pound for pound quality that goes into something like depth core in 2002 to 2012 or whatever it was? It would have been impossible without DeviantArt in that particular and then, like, Depth core was a byproduct of DeviantArt. And then did depth core accelerate the development of those artists to become a, a, a better and better and better by the month uh, group of digital uh, artists uh, just by, as a result of finding each other? By orders of magnitude. Because and when then you have a focus and you share that, yeah, you, you improve at a drastically improved rate. So when I'm seeing uh, Verizon use your artwork, you know, uh, for a season on every truck and every train and every billboard in the country of the United States uh, to, to, you know, this, uh, to, to sort of advertise itself and the, the aesthetic is uniquely, you know, looks like Justin's work, which looks like, you know, a digital art evolution that we witnessed through DeviantArt as well. Um, that's the kind of example that answers your question, right? I mean, that's us seeing um, digital art hitting the mainstream consumption of the way that things look. Um, and and, and uh, you're a great example of that. And so are the many other members of Depth Corps who did all kinds of crazy stuff, right? Yeah, if you look at the global impact of work that was produced by Depth Corps, by members of Depth Corps, uh, you'd be shocked. There's virtually nothing that they haven't touched over the course of the last decade. And you're right, it's absolutely a, a, a physical manifestation of like DeviantArt's roots just stretching into the future. Good answer. Yeah, so, so yeah, that, that, that's, um, that's been the, the, the real treat, uh, I think, for all of us at DeviantArt is to witness over 20 years that evolution, the impact. And now it's kind of hard to look at a video game, a movie, a billboard, a commercial, uh, you know, kind of virtually anything that we don't see sort of the roots of that developing uh, through the competition through the years of artists trying to make it to the homepage of DeviantArt, um, trying to make it to the homepage of their section of DeviantArt and so on and so forth. So um, yeah, it's a really, really big treat. I mean, I remember when, um, you know, one of my favorites is when Kevin Eastman, uh, who became an advisor to, to DeviantArt, he was the creator of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles with Peter Laird. And when they were making the new movies, they were using obviously DeviantArt as a reference 
um, for the way that the turtle should look. And I was providing them with some data on the back end of, of who uh, was interested in this kind of work versus that kind of work. And we now have a traced history of the look of the current turtles as depicted by Michael Bay, um, you know, uh, with, you know, conceptual art uh, history uh, from, from submissions of the turtles in 2006. So the, 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 the piece that looks most like what the turtles look like today uh, was submitted to DeviantArt in 2006. The movies were made in the 2012 or 14 or something like that time frame. Um, so th that kind of impact and and seeing uh, that kind of uh, uh, you know uh, evolution, it's it's like that stuff is so geeky fun for for us, I think, just to witness. And it's definitely it's it's completely grown over the years. Obviously, I mean, back in the early days of DeviantArt, when we used to like just kind of show up at conventions before we were really known. And, and making our name and hosting things. Um, we used to, I used to go through the lists of the artists that would be at Artist Alley and try and find their DeviantArt profiles. Um, and then I'd go through like some of the featured artists and do the same thing. And the way that that would exponentially grow over the years was absolutely mind blowing for the longest time. And now for me, when I see uh, an artist winning something or uh, being highlighted for an Oscar or whatever, it's no longer that surprising to me that they're from DeviantArt. And I find that really cool. That's an excellent segue into my next question, which was I wanted to talk a little bit about DeviantArt being involved with San Diego Comic-Con and Artist Alley in those early days. Uh, I wasn't there for that, but I know for you guys, that was a huge deal. Yeah, yeah, that was um, that was amazing. I mean, I met Clydeen Nee, who has been running Artist Alley since the very beginning of uh, the, of Comic Con. Uh, so one of the OG sort of like you know early people at, at the original convention, and and she uh, was like, look, you know, I I think when, the first day I met Clydeen, she walked me through the floor of Comic Con, and she said, this is my garden, and these are my flowers speaking of the artists who are there, and I nurture every single one of them. So I just, I loved her right away. <laughs> I was like, and she was very, very suspicious of me. She was like, I'm watching you. you know? <laughs> I don't know why, but she just, she's not a person that trusts easily. So, you know, she really, really uh, made an impact on me. And, you know, she said, look, you know, our our artist alley was one of the founding ideas of Comic Con, and you know, ever since then, a lot of commercial stuff has happened at Comic Con, and we we really have um, kind of an overwhelming presence from studios and stuff that's totally overpowering the alley, and we just need help in getting foot traffic and getting people here, you know, and and you have DeviantArt, and you know, you you can probably help us fix that. So you know, whether we wanted to do Comic Con or not. Uh, you know, we, we, you can't not help Clydeine take care of her garden. <laughs> so, so that's what we did. It was amazing. Super fun. Five years, uh, added, uh, carpeting, added, uh, you know, padded chairs. We put, um, incredibly beautiful screens at the top of the alley, promoting each of the artists inside of it. We, we installed a DeviantArt presence there. We promoted through DeviantArt and got people to the floor. It was just booming. Like, you know, it, it changed the artist alley presence at uh, San Diego Comic-Con for, for all those years. And I think ever since we uh, left, it's maintained a new standard in terms of how to do it and how to make it pop and how to make it more exciting. And, and so, um, you know, it still has quite a bit of foot traffic and it's a whole different place than what it was uh, in those years. We, we, I think we reignited it. Danny, any particular memories walking the floor at Comic-Con? Yeah, I mean, obviously, like I, I'm a big fan of a lot of things. Um, if you know me at all, I'm a huge fan of Wonder Woman. And so I, I uh, pleasantly stalk <laughs> a lot of the artists who do covers for her. Um, and one of them was Alex Garner, and I was super excited to try and find him. And I remember running through Artist Alley, and he wasn't at his booth at the time that I did. And then I had to go back to our booth to do something. And so I was kind of bummed and I was trying to figure out when I could go back. And uh, one of our other staff members went and he was there. And so he held up a sign that says, I love Moonbeam 13 and she took a picture. And so I still have that. And I'm like, <laughs> heart. But it was just one of those things like they were, like Angela said, you know, um, they didn't have that kind of foot traffic. They didn't have that kind of support. 
And so we were able to offer that, but we were so happy to do that. And they were just so thankful. And there was so much love being exchanged at that time. It was so amazing. I can feel myself I'm getting emotional. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <me too. laughs> but it was, you know, like it was it was such a great exchange of of love and support uh, in both ways. And you know, we were fanning over them, they were fanning over us, and it was just it was just a wonderful experience all around. That sounds great. We've got about five minutes left in our panel. That went really quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. So with that, I just kind of want to talk about uh, Vivian Art now. I mean, I think we've done a great job, sort of, you know, delving into the beginning and you know what what happened thereafter, but you know, we did just release a gigantic new redesign. I don't think it's well understood the effort that it takes to redesign a site with the footprint DeviantArt has. I think from the outside looking in, it's really difficult to, to really get a grip on the work involved. So perhaps it'd be good to speak to what, what the goal of this redesign is and what the process has been like. Well, I'd love to actually turn it around on you, Justin, because honestly, like for uh, for me, uh, for us, or for Andrew, you know, and for Moonbeam, we've done it. We've done this ten times, and each time it is the hardest thing we ever did in our lives, and then again, it's the hardest thing. So um, the amount of effort that goes into it is uh, astonishing. It's like along the lines of building a, you know, making a movie or building a video game or or something crazy that you know takes multiple years and a disproportionate effort against the reality that you have the existing site to run as well. So you're running two platforms at the same time and it's effing difficult. But Justin, you just went through this, as our chief creative officer, you just went through this entire process almost from start to finish for the first time from the inside. Now you went through it from the outside. How is it to you going in, through it from the inside rather than the outside? It was a lot less work from the outside, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, I was shocked. I was asked to tell you the truth. You know, I've done a lot of projects over the years and um, it's never been something that had stakeholders in the way that DeviantArt has, that had an interconnectedness between the different features and products offered on the site and the way that DeviantArt does. I've been part of renovations before where what we did was overhaul like the structure of, of uh, a, a gallery like area and a profile page and all that sort of stuff. And even that was difficult enough in and of itself, but it was really just managing hierarchies. Here you're talking about the endless shifting atomic units of DeviantArt, how they integrate. Like if you have a deviation, how many different places does that actually appear on the network? The answer is not two. The answer is it's myriad, it's insane. It is amazing how much work it takes to do even small things to do them just functionally, let alone perfectly. Isn't it weird um, how it just seems like DeviantArt is like a deviation page and a profile page and like it just looks like it's four pages and that's pretty and you're like well what's taking so long why can't you fix that or why can't you fix this one thing I care about why can't you fix this other thing I care about it's so it's so interesting I get that perspective and then I look at the actual um, very talented super powerful team working on that stuff and you can represent the issue and then it's sort of like so incredibly complicated to actually get that thing that you want done for very realistic reasons. It's very complicated. You know, people don't really see it. They see it as four pages. They don't understand that this one page, you know, gets an insane amount of traffic and the addition of like, even this small thing requires a fully scaled architecture on the back end that supports millions and millions of people using it. That's just something that people can't comprehend when they say, well, why can't you just put this little thing here? Why can't you yeah. make this button work? Why can't That's you like, add that? Yep. Yeah. Or the thing that's so important to them is not necessarily the most important thing to the large, the larger scale. So, or that thing that they want or need so badly to do what they want to do on DeviantArt is the one thing that puts a pin in all of these other things that are also so very important. <laughs> or, like it's, it's, it's the connectivity it of everything is, is mind blowing. Or when you take this web thing out, how many other things does that affect? Like it's the domino effect of, of it is, is mind boggling. And it's so hard to convey that to the community because obviously they want that thing and they're very passionate about it. And you know, it, and I get all of that. So trying to uh, express it in a way that they understand is totally different from getting getting to a point that they are willing to accept it because change is hard. 
And every Good time point. we change something, they yell at us. <laughs> oh my God. And Andrew, as our CTO for all those years, you know, uh, how, how, would, how would you describe the magnitude of the DeviantArt project? Um, you know, like relative to, um, I don't know, an MP3 player like Sonic or something else that you think of, um, how, would you, how would you describe it if you had to? From a technical perspective, um, from a front end, back end, you know, systems perspective, like how expansive of a thing is it in your vantage? It's a hard it's, question, I know. Yeah, uh, it's just complicated. I, I remember, um, uh, you know, trying to explain to people what it is and, 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 and what goes into it. And some of the analogies that always came to my mind is just, you know, yes, it is like from a traffic perspective, you know, yes, it is those four pages, but from a functionality perspective, like what we have to maintain and build is, uh, it's, it's just massive, right? It's, it's all of the admin panels and for the, the, you know, various like groups features, the users features and like all of the, 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 the editing and whatnot. It just actually just recently I was explaining to somebody, uh, this one of the underlying systems that I designed for doing art that I called the, uh, BPP bureaucratic process process. And it's just this little library that, that, um, kind of a funny name. Uh, it's this little library that essentially it helps uh, the, the flow of aggregated decision making. So it, it allows uh, uh, our groups to work, it allows various functionalities. And um, if you were to, if you were to like code that sort of like what can happen when you're dealing with very, lots of different people and making decisions over timelines, you know, like what happens when they don't, you know, things time or expire or whatnot. Um, it's just a, that's just a complicated mess. Um, and so, you know, I, I wrapped up that up into a little library and then, um, and now I know, you, you know, that's deployed everywhere, right? You know, like all kinds of features on DeviantArt use that system and that little system itself is kind of complicated, right? But it's, but we built upon it. And then, I don't know, this is not a very good answer, but the- No, it's a great one. Just, this is the yes, no system that you get for voting whether things can be in a gallery or whether they can't. Or, yes, exactly. You know, yeah. all of these yes, no, with somebody be able to join, you know, because we expanded it so that you can decide whether somebody can join your group or submit to your group, or you can create a committee of five people who have to say yes to that thing being allowed in. And you, it right. goes on a, on, a, on a vote basis. And that was so much fun to think about. And then it's just like such an enormous system to build, right? Like that, no one understands that that one unique little cute feature is a world. I yeah, think yeah, exactly. That's a whole world. Like, uh, I, yeah. Yeah, that's a whole world just, just in that. Yeah, and, in terms of the redesign and all of the features, I think we could probably go for another 45 minutes. But sadly, this 45 minutes. <laughs> All right. But who knows, maybe they'll let us do another one next year where we talk just about the development cycle. Because I'd be willing to bet there's a lot of people out there trying to start their own products in their own communities who'd be really interested to hear about that. I know I would, but sadly we spent too much time talking about our usernames in the beginning. Sad. <laughs> anyway, I want to thank uh, my panelists for joining me today. That was a really good chat, guys. I wish we could do it again. Uh, but I think we covered some great ground there and I want to thank everyone for joining us for uh, 20 years of DeviantArt and I hope you enjoy the rest of San Diego Comic-Con at home. Cheers. Thank you guys. Bye. Cheers.